Hey guys, I'm Sean McCullough. This is Bortex Solutions Manufacturing. I'm gonna give you guys a tour of my shop. Typically the clients that we're running into uh, own heavy equipment or our millwrights. They're typically seeking us whenever they have any mechanical issues with their hydraulic cylinders. The biggest thing, the EX3600 boom cylinder. So that's the mining, mining excavator. I have one here. This is your cylinder. There's two of them, they're inverted. They go on an EX3600. So we had two, one's left the building. We're just working on getting this one fixed up right now. So this one was a pretty basic rebuild. The I-bore is three thou out of tolerance. Much the same with the, uh, the I-bore on the barrel. Whoever did it previously just put in new bushings with uh, the I-bore being three thou larger than the uh, housing dimensions on the SBB bushing. So we're gonna fix that up. Like this cylinder brand new is about 211,000 Canadian, right? So a small mistake on this, you know, we don't take any shortcuts, no. Everything we do, we do for a reason, and there's a reason why we do it, right? That's basically our motto, right? Uh, we've got really good, talented guys. We only have, you know, top-notch people working here with great attitudes and good experience. We know how everything is supposed to be made, so we make sure it was made that way. Anko milling machine, much like a bridge port, this is great for doing little odd jobs and milling faces and stuff like that. We've got a glass bead machine, and then we've got our welders, Miller XMT350. This is a multi-process, so we can also do TIG, MIG, stick, and uh, I think you can also weld aluminum too. This TIG machine, I think I paid 1200 bucks for this thing, and it came with the pedal, the machine, the handle, the torch, everything. Everlast. Yeah, what a deal. And then uh, Arbor Press, I've never used. Just use a hammer. Just use a hammer, man. Arbor Press, yeah. I don't know. Never used it. If you don't have a radial arm drill, man, get a radial arm drill. The amount of times you use this thing, the convenience and ease and speed and efficiency, this thing is awesome. You can bore out, you can throw on a four, three inch drill bit on this thing and just put auto feed and just let it go. It's such a nice machine. And then this one, this is probably my coolest piece of equipment. This old Johnson, I think is made in the forties and it cuts 12, 12 inch diameter or 12 inch thick piece of uh, material. And uh, it works wicked. It cuts straight, man. I paid 700 bucks for this thing. And I think if you want to cut 12 inches, you're paying 10 grand like no matter what, like whatever machine you get. So uh, super happy about this. One of my first things I bought, pain in to move, but what, whatever reason, I love it. I'd love to restore it one day, but you know, not, probably not gonna do it. So this is a Kingston HR 4000. That's a four meter lathe. This lathe dictates what we can produce in this shop. So what we can repair. So when I get a big job that's within this, I can fix it, no problem. If I've got issues with the thread, I can machine it, re-weld it, re-machine it, machine it smaller. Uh, machine it off, drill and tap it, machine a slug to put inside to change the diameters, do whatever. Largest diameter we can swing, and swing meaning the diameter we can fit on our lathe and actually turn, is gonna be 34 inches. And we're not really gonna see a 34 inch cylinder. The largest we've, we've ever manufactured is a 24 inch OD, and that's a big press cylinder. This lathe here, this is a money maker. This is an average lathe, this is a, tw a 12 foot bed. You know, this is, this is a workhorse. Uh, we do most of our stuff that we're making, right? Or repairing, right? Most of this stuff gets done on this size lathe. And this is a great lathe, but this lathe would also only cut us off at uh, like nine feet. If I had issues with that, which we have had in the past where we've had to manufacture a new rod and a new barrel, I would have to sub that out. So I wouldn't have got that job. I wouldn't have been able to do it for an, a competitive price. I uh, wouldn't have been able to do it within a uh, respectable lead time. So we would have been out. You know, we're constantly dumping money back into place to um, better outfit our shop, right? Like we don't want, like you see, like anything you see here we built, like this bench, we built this bench because it's efficient and it does what we need it to do for the jobs that we do. The difference between us and other shops is they go and buy tools. Right, like, like in this industry, you can't, you can't buy tools, man. Like the tools that we need break, like that, that we buy break. We have a tool, the tool broke. Okay, well, why did the tool break? Well, it's weak here. Okay, well, who did we buy it from? Why did we buy it? Can we, can we make it? Can we make it stronger? Can we make it better? 
send off drawings to the water jet guys and metal guys, get the plate in, order it up, weld it, machine it. That's what we do. So the beauty of this table is one guy can work efficiently by himself with no help. So you get a job cylinder here, you wheel it over on the cart, you know, rather than using a forklift. So a guy gets a job. So now that goes on there, right? We can strap this stuff down. We use these straps. A lot of guys like to use chain, um, which is fine. These straps, these straps are good. They clamp down. Uh, if we ever have problems with it twisting and turning, we just shove a pipe. We shove a pipe in the eye and then we chain it to the bench so that it locks it. You know, for one guy to go pick this up, throw this down here, um, unhook it, go grab the rod, swing back over, put the rod in, bang, right? Versus bridge crane in a shop is great, but typically there's only one crane. You're, everyone's waiting for that crane. Everyone's using a forklift. Everyone's doing this, doing that. And then, you know, so we find the 360 jibs, you know, they work awesome. We build the bench specifically to the way we need it. And each bench we build gets a little bit better. Like, see, we got another piece here we just added. This is just the way we think. It wasn't safe, it wasn't sturdy. You know, what do we need? How do we make it better? And, you know, what's the most efficient way and cleanest, easiest way we can do it? We just add this here, pull it out, lock it, and then we basically put our pump here, and then we can bolt it to this plate so that now we can crack, like all those final drives you see Cam do, yeah. my buddy Cam. Um, you know, we can clamp those things down and, and uh, we can now torque the bolts properly and then we can make inserts to make this diameter smaller. This one was, was the first one and then this table here, this was built this size for a specific reason, <laughs> right? So typically doing cylinders these, this size. Yeah, so this was the second one we built. And then this one was just our newest build. Um, two ton crane, two ton jib. We're actually gonna put a hydraulic cylinder inside the tube and then, uh, so now when we drop cylinders on, we'll have a cylinder come out and we'll be able to put a pin. And then that cylinder is now actually gonna pull that rod out. Now we crack the bolts and then now we've got the crane and we just use the cylinder. And then now it just pulls it right out nice and smooth. So then now when we go back together, you can have your hands kind of, and your eyes paying attention to the piston. Because a lot of times you'll need two guys. You'll want a guy over here watching, make sure the piston seals aren't cutting or popping out or anything like that. Then you'll have a guy back here and he'll be banging it in. So that's coming probably in the next couple months. Much like what we're designing here with pulling cylinders apart, that's what this is for, this table here. So this bench here is for dismantling cylinders. And then it's also got a press on it. And this is how we straighten our rods and everything like that. Or you just use it like a regular press and um, you block things up and, and hope it doesn't blow up. Yeah, exactly, right? This thing here is for cracking the nuts. Um, we've got a video in our face, or on our Instagram um, that you can see us cracking the EX3600. It was just over 100,000 foot-pounds of torque to uh, release the nut. So like it takes like 50 to 80,000 pounds to tighten, but then to loosen it, it always takes like 1.5 uh, to loosen it. So, and then just actually those bolts, those bolts uh, took there's, those bolts are supposed to be torqued to 1,800 foot-pounds, and uh, it took 30, uh, 3,400 foot-pounds to just release those head bolts. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. Um, bum, bum, bum. We've got this one here. So this, this is our hone. So whenever we take cylinders apart, we polish the rod and we hone the barrel. So as we hone the barrel, it doesn't come off here until it's going to match the seal OEM specifications for the RA surface finish, which is root average. Um, so how that is, this is your surface finish, right? So these are all little tiny scratches and deep scores in your, on your surface. So it's going to give you a root average and how that calculates what it needs to do is within, you know, one inch and that gives you your surface finish. So we're gonna make sure that that surface finish is, is consistent through the whole barrel. Now we're giving that seal the correct environment it needs to withstand the pressure that it's rated for and the longevity of that seal, right? So that's why we do that. And same goes for the rod. When we're polishing a rod, we basically turn this lathe into a polisher. So as this spins, this thing spins as well. And then we go 
and then now we polish the rod. Like, see, a lot of guys think that, oh, the shinier the rod, if it's not shiny, it's, it's no good. You know, it's got to be shiny. That's too dull. In reality, is that a dull rod is better for the seal than a shiny rod. Because in those, they call them peaks and valleys, oil is going to sit in those roots and actually lubricate the seal as it goes in and out. So if you don't have any scratches, your seal is going to burn out. So your seal will actually fail sooner than if it had a rough surface finish. So because it's just burning out because the seal needs lubricant as well, right? So as it's stroking in and out, there is oil laced inside that rod and lubricating the rod seal. There's a specification for everything that we do and we need to know the specification and we need to do it to that specification. Some people may say, oh, you don't have to do that. Oh, you don't have to do this. Oh, that's overkill. You don't need to do that. You know what? You don't. But is it the right way or no? Is there smarter people out there that designed and figured that out? Yes. <laughs> is it like that way for a reason? Yes. Have they done testing? Yes. So as much as you want to say, oh, I resealed a cylinder on my bag, lasted two years. Okay, yeah, sure, it will. Maybe that rod surface finish was fine, you know? This is not so, whatever. People will say what they want. Uh, yeah, so polisher, hone, uh, tear down bench, press. Yeah, and then right now we're working on this press cylinder. Customer calls me, says, hey, the cylinder you just did is leaking, right? So, you know, when you get a call, that's only like, you know, a few months, it's, it's like, oh man. It puzzled me to understand why it was leaking so soon because it has two O-rings. It's sealed so well. I'm like, there's just no way it's leaking. It's impossible. So it's sealed right here. And then it's also sealed on the face as well. So in the event that this fails, it also has another seal. And it's got like freaking 30 bolts holding it down. <laughs> so what the hell? So anyways, we get it apart. And what do we see? We see this. This stuff is in the bolt holes. You know, oh man, the O-ring is chewed up. What happened? What went wrong? Root cause analysis. So typically when something like this happens, it's called dieseling. So when a cylinder has too much air inside the cylinder, because you're supposed to bleed all your cylinders. Obviously somebody installed this cylinder. My guess, they just put it in, hooked it up, ran it. Okay, no leaks, let's go. And it, I don't think these guys, I know they didn't follow the bleeding procedures because we have this issue. Like this just doesn't happen uh, from somebody who just put the seal in wrong or cut. Like if, there, if it was a cut, I'd be like, hey man, happens not all the time. We fix it out the door, my bad, you know, whatever, right? Box of donuts, here you go, uh, off, we, off we go. But, you know, something like this, this is impossible for us to create. So if you have too much air, it's going to, as you compress your cylinder, air compresses and explodes. So all that's happening from air blowing up inside your cylinder and it's called dieseling. And that is typically what it looks like. It looks like a rat chewed on it. Easy fix. You know, we just rebuilt the cylinder, so we know, we know it's good. <laughs> so we order uh, O-ring and backup. You know, it'll be in tomorrow. Oh yeah, so this is our new forklift, our, our brand used. Brand used forklift, Heister. It's a 12,000 pound forklift, an indoor forklift. Typically anything over 10,000 pounds, you get those big, ugly four tires, right? Anything over 10,000 pounds. And then I came across these indoor forklifts and I'm not a forklift guy. I don't know all this stuff, right? We're happy with it. Before we had a 5,000 pound forklift, which served us well and, and did whatever, but you know, the call came for a bigger cylinder and we had to get a bigger forklift. <laughs> We've got our crane and our rack here. So we got it here. Uh, when we unload the cylinder, we built this wash bay. It's a hot pressure washer. So we drop cylinders in here. We wash them, steam clean, pressure wash, degrease. Uh, and then, you know, it'll go on the rack and then uh, we'll raise a work order for it, put it into the production register and uh, we'll schedule it to be done. Uh, unless it's in a, a point where the customer is in a rush or this or that, then we work out other arrangements, right? This is the uh, spherical ball bushing out of the EX3600. Hitachi wants 19,000 bucks for this. And it needs two. Large hydraulic tank, 5,000 PSI. Smaller one is still good for 5,000 PSI. Oh, okay, look at this. This unit here is our, is our, not our filter cart. This is our oil contamination monitoring system. It's all LCD screen when it's plugged in. Uh, you hook it up to the tank, 
you suck the oil out, it goes through, it measures the viscosity, temperature, and contamination level, saturation level. Uh, cool thing about that is you get all that data real time. You don't gotta take a sample, send it in. Um, you get it right then, right there. So now you know if your oil is dirty, you need to filter it. Because actually, fun fact, oil that you buy is dirty. Did you know that? Cam, Cam. Cam tells you guys everything. Cam, that. that guy. <laughs> Cam doesn't know nothing. Yeah, so my history is 18 years old, uh, graduated semester early, and my uncle was like, hey, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was in construction, and then I'm in a hole, I'm in a ditch digging. It's raining, man, it's raining. And I'm in my wet gear, whatever, and I'm digging this ditch. And I look up and there's this fat guy with an umbrella, barely like his chin, you know, and he's looking down at me, yelling at me. And I'm just looking up at him and I'm, I'm working hard. Like I work hard, dude. I take pride in what I do and I'm, I'm just digging away. And it's, it had something to do with the water drainage and this and that. I'm just, I just remember just digging, digging. This guy just yelling at me and I look up at him and I'm just like, look down, I go, this. <laughs> This shit. Drop the fucking shovel and I look at him and I say, You fucking dig it, right? Like, I'm here digging and I know what, I, what he's saying. I'm doing it. And he's just being a. D I said, This. I go see the super and he was really great. You know, he's just like, Man, what's going on? I said, Dude, man, uh, I'm not cut out for this. And while I was there, I always, I always thought, You know, what, what makes the most money on this site, right? And then uh, you see the excavators, the big excavators. I'm like, Man, you know what? Those things make the most money. And I'm like, You know what? I want to fix those things. Right, because if those guys make the most money, I want to fix those things. Because I've just always been a mechanically inclined guy. I like tearing stuff apart. So I went down the road to trying to be a heavy duty mechanic. And at that time, apprenticeships were very hard to get. There was no jobs available. Like it was just a very saturated market. Like now today, man, you go anywhere, you get a job, right? It's crazy. So I tried to be a heavy duty mechanic. And then through those, uh, my uncle runs a backhoe and he said, uh, he's like, Hey, uh, there's this cylinder shop that's looking for th their main guy just just quit, you know. And I said, Oh, okay, yeah, I like cylinders because I was a car guy, you know. So I'm like, Oh, V8 cylinders, six cylinders, yeah, cool, cool, man. And I get in there and it's f hydraulic cylinders, and I'm like, What? What the hell is this, right? Like, I don't, not, nobody taught me this, right? You don't learn about hydraulics in school. You don't understand cylinders or what they do. You just look at a machine and go, oh wow, that's a cool machine, right? You don't really pay attention to all the little nuts and bolts and track and final drives and pumps and motors and cylinders. You know, you just don't pay attention to that stuff and it's, nobody's really made it aware. And even in school, fluid power is only touched on, I think for like one week or two weeks. So whatever, I needed a job. So I just walked in, I said, hey, I'm here. I'm looking to learn and whatever. So they hired me and I was 18. So while I, while I worked there, um, I realized that I really enjoyed working in the hydraulic cylinder business, right? Like I just, I liked doing cylinders. I was good at it. I understood it. I was fast, you know, it was just natural to me. So, and then I realized that, you know, I like it in a shop. So now I'm here. So I started my business, started in my garage, just with a lathe that size and that little tiny drill press and a dream. And here I am, three kids, no sleep, working harder than I did when I was working for somebody else and getting paid less. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm just kidding, right? So, uh, yeah, so now we're here and uh, it's been crazy. What we've accomplished in three years, um, some hydraulic shops I don't even think do in 20 years. That's why I, I, pride, I pride myself on, on making sure we have all the right tools. Can we make the tool? Is there a tool out there? No, why not? Let's make it, let's make it and badass, let's, you know, whatever, right? That's just, that's how we think and that's, that's kind of how we approach things. To that guy who is sick and tired of laying upside down in a Honda Accord, changing the heater core, you know, on his back, you know, doing this and tired in his back sore, you don't want, and you got mechanically inclined skills, man, go to a hydraulic shop. You'll work on your feet, you know, you'll do cool shit operate big pieces of equipment. It served me well and, and I enjoy doing it. Okay guys, that's it. That's my shop. I'm Sean from Bortec. You guys have any questions, leave a comment below and we'll get back to you.